seeing a shorebird on its arctic breeding grounds is just captivating. I mean, these guys epitomize understated beauty. But it's when you see a huge flock pick up as one, wheeling back and forth, that you start to get a little idea of what these birds are really about. Shorebirds are arctic breeding globetrotters. They nest on the open tundra and migrate thousands of miles to spend the winter along temperate coastlines. To cover these immense distances, shorebirds rely on an unbroken string of hospitable sites spread across hemispheres, sites that are both disparate and ephemeral. This makes migratory shorebirds incredibly vulnerable. Where such huge flocks gather, any changes to one area could have pronounced impacts on the global population of a species. Annually crisscrossing the globe, shorebirds can serve as flagship species for protecting a lot of critical habitat and living on the edge of what's possible. They're also sensitive barometers for the health of ecosystems. With that in mind, I began research on one of these amazing migrants, the wimbrel. It's a large, stocky curlew with a striped head and a decurved bill, perfectly suited to pull fiddler crabs out of their burrows on sandy beaches, or to steal them from others, as the case may be. They breed in open habitats of the Arctic and winter along both coasts, south to Tierra del Fuego. Of course, in order to protect any migratory species, we need to know precisely where the birds will be at any given time, and in what kind of numbers. To answer some of these questions, I plan to catch up with the Wimbrels for the breeding season in Churchill, Manitoba, on the shores of Hudson Bay. Churchill lies at the convergence of biomes, where the boreal forest comes from the south to meet the low arctic tundra. It's a patchwork landscape pockmarked with countless small ponds and lakes. Wimbrels are abundant here, where trees give way to wetland and tundra, and where hordes of insects provide plenty of food. The objectives of this field season were to deploy 25 geolocators that would track Wimbrels migrations, to monitor insect food abundance throughout the season, and to conduct habitat surveys to define the Wimbrel's ecological niche. Johanna Purz and I teamed up in the field to carry out each of these tasks. In order to deploy a geolocator, we needed to first find nests. So we're just headed out to go find a few nests today. And yeah, we've seen a few territorial birds, so we're just gonna head back to those areas. See what we can find. We'll slog miles through vast areas of sedge, fen, and tundra, looking and listening for wimbrels. Okay, here it is. There's a wimbrel up on this mound just to the right of the lark. An agitated adult indicates we've stumbled across an active territory. Looking for specific behaviors, we zero in on a territory's center and watch for a bird to warily sneak back to a nest. He started looping back and forth a little bit. Oh, he just fluttered, fluttered to the right. And there he is. Okay, yeah, he just settled down. We'll just go mark this one. Once a nest is located, we take its GPS coordinates so we can return another day and catch an incubating adult. Hopefully the nest is still there and hasn't been taken out by ravens or foxes. Uh, that's been a little too frequent lately. So we're just about 100 meters out from a nest right now. And uh, we'll just get a little bit set up before we flush the birds off the nest. And uh, then we'll move in and set up our bonnet trap. spring-loaded bow net allows us to take advantage of the one place we know a wimbrel will keep coming back to, the nest. Placing the bow net is a balancing act between giving the bird a safe breadth from the net and minimizing holes for escape.
Once secured, a trip line is set to hold open the net and remotely close the trap when the bird returns to incubate its eggs. Watching from under a blanket allows us to stay closer while we wait, usually within 50 meters of the nest. Sometimes it takes the bird a minute to return, and sometimes an hour. Some will walk up to the nest, craning their necks and checking out that suspicious foreign object. And those ones are really reluctant to sit back down. But almost invariably, the drive to incubate wins out. Thousands of years of being eaten have taught these birds to not let anything see them sit back on their nest. So going out there and disappearing under blankets is certainly effective, but it gives you this weird feeling that you're watching something you're not really supposed to see. And I think sharing that private moment with the bird where it nestles back down on its eggs, I think that can make it really difficult to pull the line and trap that bird. But once the bird settles safely onto its nest, we give a signal and pull the line. With the bird safely in hand, it's marked with a unique two-letter combination and the geolocator. Fastened to Wimbrel's legs, these flags allow us to identify individuals at a distance, while the light-sensing geolocators will record the timing of sunrise and sunset over the course of the following year. And these light measurements will give us the latitude and longitude of an individual on any given date. So we can track the Wimbrel's routes and pinpoint those sites that are most crucial to preserving that migration. Before going into the field, we calibrate the loggers and glue them to the alpha flags, hoping they can endure a year of storms, mud, and salt water. Then, with the bird in hand, we can quickly slip the flag over its leg and glue it closed. Both male and female wimbrels attend a nest, and being identical in plumage, we need to use a set of standard measurements to sex the bird. Females such as this one are larger with longer, more gradually curving bills. Within a few minutes of capture, we release the bird, wishing it luck. The second major component of our fieldwork is monitoring insect abundance over the course of the season. Every three days, we collect insects at a series of pitfall traps. The idea is that any insects available to a foraging shorebird chick will fall into these water troughs and we can then simply pour them through a coffee filter and bring them back to the lab for later measurements. We're trying to map out exactly when this peak in insect biomass is occurring because shorebird chicks of several species rely almost exclusively on insects for food. So these nests need to be timed very carefully such that the chicks are hatching just before the insects are most abundant. Collecting insects is straightforward enough. It happens regardless of the weather and regardless of the insect abundance. But catching birds, on the other hand, is never so certain. Fortunately, though, this season was, on the whole, quite favorable. Plenty of nests meant we could eventually deploy our geolocators. So we banded our 22nd bird this morning. Um, we have three geolocators left. So hopefully we're gonna ban one more and things are looking good. Once we had found over 50 nests and deployed all 25 geolocators, the second phase of our field season began with a comfortable buffer for all the unpredictable weather in store. Along with the storms, July brings hatch. A mere 30% of nests will actually make it this far. 
but when they do, the fen is just laden with the downy chicks of a dozen shorebird species. The parents are all frantically herding their downy chicks around, and it makes for quite a scene. Of course, a multitude of predators pay careful attention to this explosion of food. It's an opportunity they can't afford to miss. In addition to the foxes and even polar bears, aerial predators such as Jaegers and ravens take a heavy toll on the shorebirds. When those fortunate nests do hatch though, it's a pretty incredible thing to watch. When July's unpredictable weather keeps us from banding birds, it's an opportunity to start our final task for the season, habitat surveys. Wimbrels and Churchill use a surprising range of open habitats. In the open sedge meadows, like the fen, nesting wimbrels can take shelter in the multitude of forbs, with some nests revealing only a striped head and a pair of watchful eyes. But on higher ground, where the tundra is flat and dry, there is little in the way of vegetation to hide a nesting wimbrel. But that doesn't stop some of them. Here, even a few stems of the rush-like sedge are apparently satisfactory concealment. But in spite of this baffling range of nesting preferences, these detailed surveys will reveal the array of variables that sets apart suitable wimbrel habitat from the rest of the landscape. At the empty cup, we take a series of measurements. First, the dimension of the mound on which it was situated, its distance to water and the nearest tree, and the relative cover of various plant types. We measure the size of the cup itself, then identify the plants used to line it. I don't think I'm missing anything else. Okay. Finally, we identify every plant species within a 10 meter radius and classify its relative abundance. Measuring differences in the plant compositions, the proportions of one sedge species compared to another, for example, reveals key aspects of the wimbrel's ecological niche. Different plants mean different insects for food, different hydrology, different substrates, so each minute facet of the surrounding ecosystem contributes on some level to whether or not a species will find that area suitable. As climate change stands to shift the distribution of these habitats, we'll be able to predict where the wimbrels will be nesting decades down the road. Beyond the preservation of a single species, understanding shorebirds and their movements can help build a global conservation ethic. Surviving in the narrowest of margins and interacting with people all over the world, they serve as universal and acute indicators of our planet's fragile state. Migratory shorebirds depend on a global commitment to the protection of ecosystems and the linkages between them. Their unique ability to transcend international boundaries both encourages and necessitates our own attempts to do the same.